Ezra chapter 3. Main points we need to look at is, kind of hard to say, but you need to look at historically from Ezra, Moses in the tabernacle, Solomon with the temple, what's going on in Ezra time for them is present, and yet the temple is going to be rebuilt, or the Antichrist is going to be there, and the temple is going to be rebuilt or something, which I don't, I don't understand yet, but there's a temple in the millennium. What you're reading today is history, and you're also reading historical, and you're reading prophecy. It's going to happen again. The temple is gone, just like Ezra. If Ezra were, were to be today in Israel and look in Jerusalem, he'd see the same thing he's going to see right now in Ezra chapter 3. No temple. And when the seventh month was come, now the seventh month is a very important month. It's the one that has the Feast of the Tabernacles. It has the Day of Atonement. And there's one other feast I can't think of the name of. And if I were to state a statement based upon Scripture, which I can't pinpoint as scriptural, the seventh month would be the month that Jesus was actually born in. And if you were to point more and ask my opinion, and my opinion you can throw in a garbage can because this is not scriptural, but you can line it with scripture, it would be the Feast of the Tabernacle. God came into a body, but... The children of Israel were in the cities. The people gathered themselves together as one man to Jerusalem. They're no more in Babylon. They are in the land. And not only are they now in the land, but they are now in Jerusalem. Unity. Not ecumenical. There ain't all kinds of religions here. This is one body of people under God who are God's people. For God's purpose. Not to get together and have a big powwow. Ecumenical is you get everybody together for man. For the greatness of man and forget God. When we used to be back in Norwich. And they would have their, 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 their cross thing. They get all the religions together. And we had a bunch of nuns come up, well, why don't you join us? Like, no, we're not part of you guys. We, so we worship the Bible, not Mary and whoever you want to do. And they walked off. Then stood up Yeshua, the son of Zodak, and his brethren, the priests. And Zerubbabel, the son of Shatili, and his brethren. And builded the altar of the God of Israel. There is no temple yet. There is no city. They build an altar first. To offer burnt offerings thereon. As is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. The, the burnt offerings. And you can find that written in the law. We've gone through that through Leviticus, uh, Deuteronomy. And I believe in Numbers. And one of those books, I mean, just lays it out. Offering by offering by offering. What you're to bring, how you're to bring it, what was to be done with it, who, what, where, and why. And they set the altar upon his basis. Well, where did the basis come from? There was one time that one of the kings we read, he took off the bases, chopped them up because they were brass. Evidently, they were carried back somehow to Babylon, remade, carried to Babylon or something, but here are the bases. For fear was upon, the, fear upon them because of the people of those countries. That's where Israel is today. Don't you see that? 
They're living in, they're this little nation surrounded by all their kindred. You do know that they're their kindred. If it's not Abraham's children from Hagar or Ketra, it's from uncle or cousin Lot and his two boys. Listen, the worst people you can have under God is your family. And here they are. They're in the land. And you're in 2013. They're in fear. I read today in my readings of uh, uh, Zechariah. It said the children shall play in the streets. They're not doing that today. The children go to school with an AK-7 strapped to their book bag. You could be having coffee at a, at a cafe or whatever over there, and next you know, have somebody pull a string on their belt, and then you're meeting whatever God you believe in. And they offered burnt offerings thereon unto the Lord, even burnt offerings morning and evening. So there goes the, the, the sheep in the morning and the sheep at night. According to the law. So they know what the law says. They know what to do. They're not just going over there and, put, and just throwing everything together and doing what they want. You can't just throw a church together. Okay, we'll make up the rules as we go. You can't do that. Especially thank you to the Supreme Court yesterday when they say sodomites can get married now. Because guess what? you got to have in your constitution now that you will not marry them. And the government does not recognize a church constitution where the people draw it up, then you got a nation that's perverted, but you got a set of laws and rules and regulations for your church, which I advise anybody listening right now, you better check your church constitution. You need to add that you're only going to marry a male and a female. Then later on, take the consequences. Because I guarantee the government will not recognize that. You'll get some Steve and Eve or whoever and all that other stuff. They'll come into your church. Well, we want you to marry. Well, we ain't going to marry you. Then they'll go run to their ACLU and they'll go run to their lawyers. And then they'll put you on CNN. They'll put you on ABC. As oh, this mean, wicked, bigoted, uh, uh, bigoted church won't marry these two males or two females. That's the next one. Listen, allowing them to marry is the first step. The next step is they'll put us churches on the CBS, they'll put us on the ABC, and they'll say, look at that. Look what they're doing. They're bigoted. Because they won't marry this whatever you want to have them to be. They kept the Feast of Tabernacles. Again, that's in the seventh month. And it's funny how that's the tab that, that's the, the feast that they kept as soon as they're there and that like I said that's quite possibility when Jesus was born Leviticus 23:44 is the, is the feast of the tabernacles they're back to the book of Moses and offer the daily burnt offerings by number according to the custom as the duty of every day required, they this feast was seven days. They did exactly what the what the book did told them to do. Well, no, I mean the book. I mean the book of Moses. It was one book. Christians are to do what the book tells you to do. And the Bible says, "Study to show thyself approved unto, unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word." You gotta rightly divide. You can't just jump in there and pick what you want. These people could not go into the law on the Feast of Tabernacles and say, well, let's throw a little Passover into it. God would not allow that. If they were saying the Feast of Tabernacles, well, we're supposed to put blood on the door. God would not allow that. Afterward, offered the continued burnt offering. Continued burnt offering, that would be what everything, every day, the two lambs and everything that would be followed on that burnt offering. 
both of the new moons, that's the first day of the month for the Jews. Their calendar is a lunar calendar. Ours is solar. And it's all messed up. We got 29 days, 30 days, 31 days, hold your breath days. No wonder we don't know what the time and periods are. By the way, our calendar is also Roman. And all the set feasts. Now the set feasts are the Passover, the unleavened bread, the first fruits, the wave offering, the trumpets, the atonement day, the day of atonement, and tabernacle. Seven feasts of the Lord that were consecrated, and of every one willing offered a free will offer unto the Lord. There's your offering for the for the church, the free will offering. You give what you want to give voluntarily because you want to give. From the first day of Feast of Trumpets, of the seventh month began they to offer burnt offerings unto the Lord, but the foundation of the temple of the Lord was not yet laid. So just the altar there, that's it. Now let me ask you a question. When Moses set up the tabernacle, everything was there, right? Yes. When Solomon built the temple, everything was there, right? Yes. When Ezra sets up the, the, the thing here, is everything there? No. So what is there a possibility is going to happen They might have in Israel coming up, they just b build an altar and start offering sacrifices, and the temple comes afterwards. Two times in the history, the tabernacle, when they had it all set up, everything was there. Now they're just having the, the, the altar, and there's no tabernacle. It said, I mean, God just doesn't throw words in there. There's a specific reason. But the foundation and temple of the Lord was not yet laid. Why would God throw that in there? Now, what I'm saying here is something that, listen, you can take and throw in a garbage can. You don't have to believe what I'm saying, but there's a possibility that when it comes to that temple in the tribulation, you might just see the altar go up first. As we get into Ezra and Nehemiah, you'll see why I'm saying that. They gave money also unto the masons and to the carpenters. Masons are stone builders. Carpenters are people of wood. And meat, food, and drink, water, wine, grape juice, and oil. That's probably for the machinery. Oil was used as a, uh, you know, for skin. I mean, they're working in extreme heat and sun over there. They would anoint the priests. And unto them of Zidon, and unto them of Tyre. Tyre was a major seaport that has not yet been destroyed. To bring cedar trees from Lebanon to the Sea of Joppa according to the grant that they had of Cyrus, king of Persia. So everything is all by Cyrus. And a Gentile king is ordering and providing. David, the Jewish king, ordered and provided the temple. You maybe want to take a guess who will order and provide the next temple? By the way, the first tabernacle of Moses, God ordered the temple. Then David, well, tabernacle, then David ordered the temple. Here, Cyrus, a, a Gentile king, orders the temple. Rome rebuilds and reconstructs the temple in Jesus' time, that temple. 
I wonder who's going to set up the next temple and order them. What, I mean, I guess you can take this. You don't have to. You don't have to believe this stuff. But if the Antichrist's most object, uh, most, I wonder where I'm trying to think about. It. The main source for the Antichrist is to gather the Jews to kill him. What would be the one thing he get? How he get the Jews together? The Book of Moses and all the feast days. And what, what's the Bible say? Three times a year, those Jews are to be where? In Jerusalem. How would he get them three times a year in Jerusalem? If there's a temple. How would he do it? Uh, excuse me, people, Jews. Your law says, your God says, Moses says, you're supposed to be in this city at this temple three times a year. And he would open up the Bible and quote to them the Bible. Now, again, you can take all this. You don't have to believe that. But doesn't that seem efficient? <laughs> now, in the second year of their coming unto the house of God at Jerusalem, in the second month, began Zerubbabel, the son of Shetio, Sh and Jeshua, the son of Josodak, and the raiment of their brethren, the priests and the Levites, and all they were come out of the captivity of Jerusalem. I mean, excuse me, into Jerusalem. Or is that on to? I can't see that first letter. Is that an I or N? You. Yeah. Yeah, let me make a note here. I can't see that. All I see is UNT. All right. Unto Jerusalem and appointed the Levites from 20 years old and upward. All right. How do you know that Jesus Christ wasn't a Levite? Because he began his ministry at 30 years old. From 20 years old and upward to set forward the work of the house of the Lord. And stood Yeshua with his sons and his brethren, Cadmiel and his sons, the sons of Ju Judah, together to set forward the workmen in the house of God, the sons of Hanadad, with, his son, with their sons and their brethren, the Levites. And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, they set the priests in their apparel. You find that back there in Exodus, when they described the robes, the bonnets, the ephods, everything in the priests. It's back. Their apparel with trumpets. And Levites, the son of Asaph, with symbols. There's that Asaph you see in Psalms. If that's the same Asaph of David's time, that guy was so faithful in the Lord that God had his, had his sons be right here back at the temple. Guess what? They're right back to where they were with David in Solomon's time. And you couldn't find a family of Asaph today if you went with a microscope and drew every Jewish blood. How are you going to find out who the Jews are in the future? God knows. With symbols to praise the Lord after the ordinance of David, king of Israel. Now David added to the worship of the Lord with the music. But God approved of it. You don't see anywhere about symbols or, or worship music in the book of Moses. David added that. And God approved of it. And they sang together by chorus in praising and giving thanks unto the Lord because he is good. For his mercy endureth forever toward Israel. And all the people shout with a great shout when they praise the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and Levites and the chief of the fathers who were ancient men 
old timers has seen the first house they were in Babylon for 70 years there are some men that, that saw Solomon's temple and the foundation of this house were, was laid before their eyes wept with a loud voice and many shouted aloud for joy. There are people shouting because here is this brand new temple. It's beginning. It's starting. And the old timers is looking like, oh, if we had not only sinned, if we had done what God wanted us to do, we would not be in the state we are. And they're looking around and everything's destroyed. When we, when we run into Nehemiah chapter 1, when they bring word back to Nehemiah, he's like, well, how is it? The gates, the walls are destroyed. And he takes a little ride on his animal. And he goes out walking. And he just sees utter destruction. Here are the priests. Here are the Levites. They're in Jerusalem. They're at the site where the temple is. And there is no temple. They're just looking at the foundation of this beautiful building that, that Solomon dedicated to the Lord has been destroyed because of sin. So that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping of the people. For the people shouted with a loud shout, the noise was heard afar off. No airplanes, no engines, no nothing. To, uh, it must have been beautiful. Now about the cedar trees that we read about in verse 7. I'll try to read this the best I can. It is easy to see how much the Lebanon cedar tree is reverend by the residents of eastern Mediterranean country. The large evergreen is featured prominently on the country's flag and its coat of arms. The massive cedar with its network of branches is national emblem of Lebanon, though its value is known the world over. Known for its eye-popping maze of twisting offshoots, the Lebanon cedar is easy to spot in a forest of evergreens. The aromatic cedar can grow to more than 80 feet tall. However, an expansive canopy is what draws the most attention. The tree's wide spreading branches can flatten and spread out to 50 feet or more. The branches, the Lebanon cedar's massive horizontal branches, conform to its habitat. When Forced to grow in a dense forest, the branches grow straight and narrow. However, when allowed to fly in open spaces, the tree is free to spread and flatten to create a voluminous canopy. Given its roots as an evergreen, the Lebanon cedar leaves are needle-like in shape rather than flat and oblong. The long, stiff needles grow in tufts and are deep blue-green. The tufts, which consist of 30 to 40 needles, are often referred as rosettes, remain on the tree for about two years before falling to the ground. The Leban Lebanon cedar's flowers, or catkins, don't appear on the tree until its 25th growing season. Each drooping catkin measures about two inches long and is reddish-brown in color. The Lebanon cedar's fruit are barrel-shaped cones that measure about five inches long. Young cones are light green and scaly, but as the tree ages, the seed-containing cones turn dull brown color. The Lebanon cedar is, form, is formerly known as the cedar of Lebanon. The ornamental tree is part of the cedarous Lebanon species. This specific type of cedar is native to Lebanon and other parts of the Mediterranean region, including Turkey, Palestine, and Israel. It does not have a subspecies. Rather, the tree is one of the two distinct types of Cedrius Lebanon, among with the Turkish cedar. Similar to its Turkish cousin, the Lebanon cedar is a slow-growing tree whose longevity is legendary. 
Some Lebanon seers have been on this earth for more than a thousand years. The historical cedar grows in a mountainous area of Lebanon. However, that is not the only place you will find its beauty. The Lebanon cedar, which thrives in deep soil and high, high ele elevations in warm temperature regions, has been planted throughout the world, including the Tartarus Mountains of Syria and the Poly Hill on Martha's Vineyard, Massachusetts. While a large forest of native cedars used to graze the hills of ancient Lebanon, these days the tree only remains in small patches across the country. Unfortunately, the Le Lebanon cedar couldn't withstand the scourging of ancient Phoenicians who used the timber for their ships and others who ravaged the forest to create country's most popular city, as well as thrones, altars, and statues from the tree's wood. There's more. The Lebanon cedar is prized for its versatility. In addition to being attractive, fragrant, and commercially valuable, the tree has a number of medical uses. The cedar oils are, are known to help with the following ailments. Abdominal pain, poor circulation, diarrhea, arthritic joints, cuts and scrapes, and rashes. Ancient Lebanese also use the tree's oils to increase immune cell production. production. In addition, many believe the tannins and flavonoids found in the tree's wood are able to cure warts and other skin problems. The Lebanon cedar is referred to in the Bible numerous times. The book mentions the forest of cedar trees located just north of Israel in what is now Lebanon. Today, most, most of the forests have been wiped clean, which is why the cedar tree is a protected species in Lebanon. The long exportation of the precious tree has prompted programs to conserve and regulate Lebanon cedar forests. The, Lebanon, the Lebanese are trying to repopulate the forest via natural regeneration instead of actively replanting the trees. Ornamental Lebanon cedar, ornamental Lebanon ornament. Okay. Lebanon cedars are extremely hardy trees and are not prone to diseases or pests. The cedar requires large doses of sunlight as well as plenty of water. However, if the tree is exposed to an extensive amount of liquid, it can experience root rot. The disease can be deadly if the soil surrounding the tree rots does not have accurate, accurate damage drainage. Water-soaked soil makes it very difficult for the roots of the cedar in Lebanon to get air, which leads to decay. And it tells you how to avoid root rot. When, a, when adding a young cedar tree to your property, be sure to plant it in the winter or early spring, as the roots don't take well to be in transplanted in the hot summer months. And this talks about Again, how to plant it if you were to buy one. Well, that's the Lebanon cedar tree, and we'll close there.